The Word of God. We call ourselves the people of the book. Oh, are we? Are we not? I think we're going to switch over. I, I don't know that I can do that. <laughs> we'll. We're going to try. I mean, it's got strange things in it. We don't think of that often, but if you read through it, you'll find angels and demons and giants and dragons, seven-headed beasts rising from the sea, human-faced locusts coming from an abyss, sea monsters with names like Leviathan and Rahab inhabit the ocean depths, and the sons of God somehow cohabitate with the daughters of men. The whole earth gets covered by a flood, killing everybody except one family who's saved on basically a barge. Fire and brimstone rain down on cities, obliterating them, wiping them out completely, and a woman turns into a pillar of salt. The mighty river Nile turns into blood. Frogs, plagues, pestilence. A powerful wind rolls back an entire sea so that a whole nation crosses on dry ground. Iron axe heads float in the water. Dead people come back to life. Strange things indeed. Also strange to our ears can be the many commands that are given in the Bible. People are told to cut the throats of animals, drain their blood, and offer them as sacrifices to the Lord. We don't do that, do we? People are commanded to not eat certain foods like pork. No more pulled pork. No shellfish. Don't plant two different crops in the same field. Don't wear clothing made of more than one material. Anybody got a cotton poly blend on this morning? The Bible says no. Don't tattoo your body. Don't work on Saturday, the Sabbath, or you will face execution if you do. Even in the New Testament, where we Christians tend to feel a little more at home, we find people commanded to greet one another with a kiss, to wash each other's feet. Some are told to sell everything they have and give it to the poor. Women are told not to wear any pearls or gold jewelry. Women are told to cover their heads with a veil, especially in church, and to keep quiet when they get there. Christians today obviously don't obey all of these commands, but why? Are they just cultural? What about other commands like avoid homosexuality? Were those just cultural and of a certain era? The Bible is full of strange and interesting stories. How much is cultural? How much is command? What is being described? What is being prescribed for us? These are questions we've seen we're having to face as we walk through the book of Acts. Because Acts is a book of history, and it's full of amazing stories, and we're about to read an incredible encounter today. Is it to be normal? Is it to be the way that things are? Is this the pattern of how things are supposed to work? Or is it simply a description of what happened? We've been talking quite a bit these last months about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the disciples were told to stay in Jerusalem until they received power. Then they could become his witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. But in the first seven chapters of Acts, we haven't seen anybody leave Jerusalem yet. That's all about to change today. The gospel is about to expand. Things are about to start happening. And the stories get wilder, weirder, more strange to us as the gospel expands. You thought tongues descending like fire and people speaking strange languages together in a room were strange. It's about to explode, and Luke is going to detail these stories, and and yet he only tells us some of them. We've encountered Peter and John. James, the son of Zebedee, will get mentioned only in the next chapter when he gets beheaded. The other James, who's an elder of the church, the brother of Jesus, will get mentioned. We read nothing in the book of Acts about Matthew. What about Bartholomew? What about doubting Thomas? What happened to him? None of these other disciples are even named in the book of Acts. Luke has chosen to tell of certain people and certain stories, and one of our tasks today is going to be to start to realize Luke is telling us a certain story, and he's choosing a certain set of events of all of the thousands of stories he could have told and the thousands of encounters that all of the different disciples had, all of those who were going out and sharing. We're going to read a story today about Philip. He's not even one of the 12. He was just one of those seven who was chosen to help wait on the tables. 
but we're going to see the gospel start leaving Jerusalem and expanding. And, and I think one of the questions Luke is going to answer for us, because you've got to realize here in 2024, we're sitting in a room full of Gentiles. And it's become so commonplace to us that the gospel is ours and the gospel belongs to us. We're going to have to remember that 2,000 years ago, that was anathema. To think that God would go to the Gentiles? To think that we would have any part in the family of God? Even the really good Jews living in Jerusalem, even the Christian Jews like Peter, had a real struggle with grasping that God would be for the Gentiles too? So we find ourselves today really answering the question, well, when do we receive power? Those disciples received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. We're going to see them start going out. And one of the struggles we might have as we learn about and read about and understand the Holy Spirit is, do we get to experience the same kind of power? And what does that look like? And when did we get it? Or when will we get it? Or, or what's going on here? Because... Far too often, we live pretty commonplace lives. We don't live supernaturally. We don't live day by day in kind of a hypernatural experience seeing God fully, completely at work. So when do we receive power? Do we have the same Holy Spirit they had? Do we have it to the same degree? Does everyone have access to the same Spirit in the same way? These are part of the questions we're going to answer. So first, we turn to Acts chapter 8. A little tricky to do one-handed here. Acts chapter 8, we're going to start with verse 1. But we're going to look at this idea of when do we receive power? Really, when did we or do we receive the Holy Spirit? And is there more than one time? What does that look like? Because there's a whole lot of ideas out there. Maybe you've heard some of these. So we're going to look at this this morning. This passage leads us there. First off, though, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. I'm just going to read that for you because Luke is telling the story. He just talked about the stoning of Stephen, and he ended with the fact that Saul was there, and Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And that's really the end of chapter 7. But we'll start with chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that very day, a great persecution rose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Do you catch that? We've got thousands and thousands of members of the church now. And because of the intensity of the persecution, Luke seems to be saying, all of them, the thousands of them, all had to leave Jerusalem, except for the twelve. The twelve are still there, and, and they're standing strong, but they're coming under more intense attack. We're see not, not only are they just going to take him to jail now and overnight and then tell him to stop, we're going to see martyrdoms very quickly come about in Jerusalem. So the Christians are scattered. They go throughout Judea. They go throughout Samaria. But as they're going, they're spreading the word of God. Verse 2, some devout men buried Stephen. They made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church entering house after house, dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had scattered went about preaching the word. So they didn't just run away in fear. They didn't just stop believing in Christ. The word now is spreading. Now, some have taken this and say, well, God had to bring persecution to get them out of Jerusalem because they were being disobedient. Luke doesn't seem to suggest that. I think that's pressing the text a little too far. Some have built whole theologies off of that and say God had to bring persecution. The church was dis. I, I don't find that in this text. That's someone's application of the text. What we see, though, is persecution comes, the church scattered, the word is being spread. And just a point here. It's not the main point, but just kind of an intro. That's why I said difficulty is not necessarily a sign of God's disapproval. It can be. I mean, we see, especially throughout the Old Testament, God sometimes brought difficulty and brought burdens so that people would come back to him. But listen, Christian, just because your life is difficult, just because you're going through difficulty, even persecution, and nothing's working out, doesn't necessarily mean God has disapproved of you. Uh, there's no indication here from Luke that, oh, the church was unfaithful, the church wasn't doing what it should, so God had... Persecution came. Because people like Saul hated the church. They hated the message of Jesus Christ. They hated that it confronted their human pride and their religious systems. And still today, people hate the message of Jesus Christ. 
I don't mean they disagree with it. They don't like it. They think everybody should. People hate the message of Jesus Christ. They hated Jesus. Their anger we see throughout the just They hated him, and he said, are you servants above your master? They're going to hate you. That's normal for the Christian life. Luke said this in his gospel, Luke 21. Okay, here I do the one-handed thing again. This is just new for me. Luke chapter 21, verses 12 to 17. I know we've read them before. If you haven't circled them, highlighted, underlined them, now would be a good time to set them apart. Luke, in his gospel, recording the words of Jesus, writes this in verses 12 to 17. Jesus said, before all these things, the end times, they will lay their hands on you. They will persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons. They will bring you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. The word testimony is the same word for martyrdom. <laughs> you will be able to speak the truth of Christ as you are suffering. So make up your mind not to, protect, not to prepare your hearts beforehand to defend yourselves. I'll give you utterance. I'll give you wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to refute. But you'll be delivered up. Some of you, even by your parents, your brothers, your relatives and friends, they will put some of you to death and you will be hated by all on account of my name. Jesus warned us, persecution comes with the territory. 250 times in the New Testament, we're told that persecution is normal. Persecution is normative. So I'm saying, so difficulty is not a sign of God's disapproval. Some are like, is God happy with me? I'm hearing the Holy Spirit. I, I, I must not be following the Spirit because life is hard. Things are difficult. People don't. That's not an indication of whether or not you're following the Holy Spirit necessarily. He might use difficulty to shape you and to move you. He can discipline us. To, but very often it's just persecution and it's normal. And it's not a sign that you're missing the Holy Spirit or you're not strong in the Holy Spirit. These are faithful believers who are being persecuted constantly. We're going to find Paul, the greatest evangelist, later, when he's done persecuting the church and is serving God, he becomes intensely persecuted constantly. He goes through the number of times he was beaten and stoned and left for dead. So persecution is normal for the Christian. And Paul had to learn to be content in whatever state he was in. Look in Philippians chapter 4. There's, there's a great verse here that we so often take out of its context but recognize it's in the midst of difficulty and sometimes hardship. And that doesn't necessarily mean God's disappointed with us. Sometimes he blesses us with great prosperity and peace and just a, a season of uh, just rest and, and, and no difficulty. So Paul said he had to learn in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. I don't speak from want. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. Why? Because sometimes God humbled him, and sometimes God prospered him. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and the secret of going hungry, of having abundance and of suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Your circumstances are not necessarily an indication of God's approval or disapproval. And we need to recognize that and know that as we're seeking to follow the Spirit, you know, well, things are hard, things are rough, I must not be, but that's not necessarily an indication of God's disapproval. By the same token, acceptance and ease and prosperity is not necessarily a sign of God's approval. Let's go back to Acts, Acts chapter 8, and see what was taking place there. So we've just found out that in verse 4, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip, verse 5, Philip who was not one of the 12, not one of the disciples, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now that's actually going north from Jerusalem, but it's down the hills and it's to the lower country. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip. And they heard and they saw the signs that he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits that were coming out shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was much rejoicing. Yeah, Stephen, I went there. And there was much rejoicing. Yes, okay, moving on. Now there was a certain man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. 
and they were giving him attention because he for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. So here's a guy who's popular. Here's a guy that everybody's coming to. He's performing great signs and wonders, and they revere him as the great power of God that seems to be a Samaritan name for the chief God in their system. And they are calling him Simon the Great, Simon Magus, Simon the Wonderful One. And he was performing real signs and wonders. And if you do some research on the guy, you'll find it in the second and third century, people are still writing about him. Jewish authors are talking about he did amazing things. I mean, he performed signs and wonders and miracles and healings and exorcisms. He, he was something. Does that mean God approved of him because he was popular? No, not at all. Simon astounded people. They accepted Simon. They paid attention to him. They were all clamoring to him. They were astonished at him. Some sort of magic, some sort of sorcery. What had he tapped into? I don't know. Have you ever encountered spiritual power that didn't seem to be of God? Have you ever encountered, sensed, and experienced something? You go, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. What was that? There was a time when I was a youth pastor back in Texas. I was probably just 19, 20 years old. And the associate pastor there had been called to, to drive across Texas and do a revival service for two days at a different church. He asked if I would go with him. Now, he was married and had a family, but they weren't able to go, and he didn't want to just go alone. He thought it would be better to have two go. And, and so he said, hey, you're on step. Do you want to go? We'll make a couple days of it, and it'll be a neat experience. I'm like, absolutely, road trip. So we road tripped across a couple hundred miles of Texas. Don't even remember the name of the town, but one evening we were driving, and we were starting to get low on gas. And in Texas, it's one of you better get gas when you see it, because it might be 150 miles to the next town. Do We stopped in this little town off the interstate, we went into this store where he, he was filling with gas and I, we're going to get a drink or snacks or something. And I walked in and it was like one of those movies where as soon as I walked in, three or four people in the store just kind of stopped. And they looked at me and I thought, man, we're like walking into a scene out of deliverance. This is just weird. And they had these expressions on their face. I'm, I'm just going through the store like, what the heck? And I... I got like a soda or something and probably some Funyuns or corn nuts. I mean, this is, you know, back in the day. And I'm going up to the register, and, and Bob Greggs, he's the associate pastor, so he comes in, and he just like stops, looks around, his eyes lock with mine, and I'm like, oh. We go up, and we pay for things, and he gives me this look like, let's get the heck out of here. And we go back out to the car, and as soon as we get in the car, he looks at me, and he goes, what was that? I have no idea. He's like, you pray, I'll drive. And we took off and headed down the road. And we're like, we're not going to stay anywhere near that. It, it was just, there was something spiritual going on in that little town. And it was not of God. It was, it was not just like awkward, like we're strangers. There was a presence there. Pam and I felt that a couple of times. We just sensed it when we were in Russian areas where there had been no believers and we were praying over an area to come to Christ and there's just opposition. And there's What had Simon tapped into? It was not the Holy Spirit. It wasn't God. But he's doing actual metaphysical things that no one can explain except they're astonished and they think it's coming from some great power. Well, does that mean he was following God because he could do things and people followed him? No. That's not necessarily a sign of God's approval. There are religious leaders all over this world from different cults and different groups who are doing things, and some of them come with power, and they come and they're rather extraordinary, and people follow them. It goes well for them. People are paying them attention. Is that how you know you're following the Holy Spirit? Everybody likes you and pays attention to you? That's not necessarily a sign of God's approval. From this guy, we get a word in the English language. His name was Simon Magus, and because of this story... We now have a term called simony. You can look it up in any English dictionary. And it's a term of reproach. And see, it means to sell religious ordinances or to do religious practices for the sake of gain or for money. It's like selling indulgences or saying you can forgive sins or you can get people out of hell and into heaven if you pay them to do certain things. All comes from this guy who was a, a real person in Samaria 2,000 years ago. Well, well let's, let's go on with the story. He, he wasn't being approved by God. He was doing some kind of magical arts. But now 
Now we got to get into the story of what happened. And from this point on, I got to tell you, good hermeneutics are going to be really important. And we're going to have to talk about hermeneutics. Some of you have never heard of hermeneutics before. Anyway, I know I had to do that. Yeah, I know. Not him either. Okay, good hermeneutics are important. Let's look at verse 12, and then we're going to go back and <laughs> roll your eyes. I don't care. Dad jokes. When they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed at Philip. So now the guy who's been so popular for so long, now he's just in awe of what Philip is able to do. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. And, and don't get this, this, oh, how lovely, let us send Peter and John. It was more like, wait, what? Samaritans? We better send Peter and John down to check this out. Luke is going to describe what happened, and then we're going to have to figure out what to make of it. Verse 15. Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they, the Samaritans, were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bespoke, bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered Peter and John money and said, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive this Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. That's where Simon he comes from. You have no part or portion in this matter. Your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord, if possible, the intention of your heart might be forgiven you, for I see you're in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you said may come upon me. What in the world is going on? We're going to have to figure out, and we're going to have to do some work to see what was taking place because we've got people who believed the message of Jesus Christ, put their faith and trust in him alone for their salvation. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. And Luke says, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet because they were just believers who were baptized. And then Peter and John came down, and they had to preach them, and they had to lay hands on them, and then they received the Holy Spirit. So what's going on here? Good hermeneutics is necessary. Some of you are like, okay, what, what's this hermeneutics thing? Acts 14, 12. One of the times when Paul is on his ministry, we're going to see this take place. It helps us understand what's going on. Acts 14, 12. They get mistaken for gods. And so in verse 12, it said, They began calling Barnabas Zeus, and they called Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. What, what's going on? Paul and Barnabas one time down the road go into a town, and they're doing these amazing things, and the people there are like, oh, the gods are among us. Barnabas, he's the quiet, tall one. He must be Zeus. And this one who speaks the message of the gods, he must be Hermes. Hermes was the Greek messenger god. In Greek mythology, Hermes was the one who came down from heaven and translated the messages of the god for the people. He also escorted people to Hades. He was a Greek god. This is kind of a representation. See the little wings on his feet? So he could fly back and forth between heaven and earth and take the message from the gods in Olympus down to the humans on earth and translate it for him. He's holding what we call a caduceus in his hands. It's an emblem of peace and an emblem of mercy, and it was commonly associated with ambassadors and emissaries. Basically, I come in peace. Also kind of like, don't shoot the messenger. I'm literally just the messenger. And Hermes was just the messenger god. And he was the one who they said brought the message from the gods down to man. So that was Hermes. He may look familiar to you. FTD Floor started using the symbol of Mercury Man in 1914. 110 years they've been using this. You say, well, why is he called Mercury Man? In the Greek language, they called this god Hermes. But in Latin, used by the Roman, they called him Mercury. You know, like the planet Mercury gets named after the same guy. So that's what's going on here. Hermes, or Mercury, Hermes is the messenger god. He translates the message of the gods for the people. 
So a Greek word hermeneuo, taken from his name, means to translate a message, especially one from a god or gods. And it's just a regular Greek word, hermeneuo, to translate a message. In fact, it's used several times in the New Testament. Here's, here's a couple examples of it. John 1.42 Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. See those words in bold? That's literally the Greek words hermeneuo, to translate something. Hebrews 7.2, Melchizedek is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then king of Salem, king of peace. By translation, that's the Greek word hermeneuo that's been interpreted. So this great big hermeneutics word that we have in English is simply from the Greek word to translate, to be translated. And hermeneutics then is the method and principles of interpretation, especially interpreting biblical text. Makes sense now, right? Like Hermes was the messenger God. He translated God's messages. We just have a Greek word, hermeneuo, to translate, to explain, to, to put into words that we can understand. So we have this study of things called hermeneutics, which I had never heard of, never been introduced to until I went to Moody Bible Institute in my 20s. And I got into a class called hermeneutics with Les Keylock, and I was fascinated. Like, oh, that's how you figure out what the Bible's saying. That's how we start to learn what the Bible's doing. I applied to become the guy's teaching assistant, got the job, and for the next year was teaching assistant to this hermeneutics professor. And I got to make up his quiz and tests, and I got to read the papers and grade stuff. And I'm like, this world of hermeneutics began to fascinate me. Some years later, when I was in my Ph.D. program, I was in advanced hermeneutics in the Ph.D. level, and the, the professor there, Dr. McAlpin, asked if I would be his teaching assistant for a year, and I did. And then he got injured, and I ended up teaching his class for him a couple times. I was like, this is great stuff. I love hermeneutics. I began to advance in it. Before too long, I was a professor of hermeneutics classes, and I was teaching Introduction to Hermeneutics for the undergraduates and the graduates at the seminary down the road. And I'm like, I love this stuff so much, got more and more into it. They had me teaching hermeneutics to the doctoral students in the PhD level, advanced biblical hermeneutics. So I say that to say this, love this stuff, right? I'm trying to give you a condensed little bit of this. How do we interpret a passage like Acts 8? Where Philip went to the Samaritans and they received the gospel and believed it in their hearts and were baptized, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And we got to go, oh, what is that? Does that happen today? What's happening? Here's why hermeneutics is so important. Because the Bible was written to somebody else who lived a long time ago in another part of the world where they spoke a different language and had different cultural values. And this text from Luke is 2,000 years old. And it wasn't written to us. It was written to Theophilus and maybe others. And it was written in Greek, a language we don't understand, by a Gentile who had become a proselyte into this new Christian faith, which was primarily the Jewish people. And he's writing about what happened in Samaria, which is a whole other cultural context than Jerusalem. So we have to apply some principles and figure out we can't just come to this passage. Well, this is the way things happen. Bad hermeneutics? has been taken over by a number of religious groups and denominations. Pentecostals, Assemblies of God, will come to this passage and say, Acts 8 is the model. You receive the gospel and you're baptized and you become a believer and you're a born-again Christian, but the Spirit comes later at a second blessing or a second laying on of hands or a second event, and it will come with demonstration of signs and tongues and miracles. And there are churches who teach that. And they teach that you can be a Christian and you're going to heaven, but you don't have the Holy Spirit. And he comes later. That's bad hermeneutics from this passage. The Catholic Church developed their whole teaching in the third century of baptism and then confirmation later that you can be in and you can be part of the faith, but you don't receive the Spirit until later, until you're confirmed. All of that comes from a bad interpretation of Acts 8, from poor hermeneutical practices. We don't want to do that. We want to look at this passage and not just say, oh, well, sometimes this is what happens. We want to look at this in a whole different way. There's a slide you can go back and look at later. It's in the slide, so you'll have it this week. It's kind of a good summary of, of hermeneutics and a way to approach it. Here's what happened in Acts 8, 12 through 24. There was a two-stage process in Samaria. They became believers. They fully accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. Jesus. 
But the Holy Spirit didn't come until Peter and John came down. Now that's a description. That's an accurate historical description of what happened. But does that make it a prescription of what should happen? Hermeneutics would say, hold on. Let's look at this passage in its depth. Let's look at its context. Let's look culturally what was going on. And then in literary and theological practices, we'll look at the broader passage in the New Testament and we'll come up with some better solutions, which we're going to try to do in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Luke describes what happened. But do you remember what the Samaritans were? Uh, do you remember the story of when Jesus went there and met a woman at a well? He had been traveling with the disciples, and instead of going around Samaria, which most good Jews did, to get to the northern part of Israel, they went right through the land of Samaria. Chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. Here's how John himself says it later. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus talked to her and said, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said in reply, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? And here's John's commentary. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. John the disciple, John the beloved is like, doo, 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 doo. We, we didn't talk with them. We rejected them. Do you remember where the Samaritans came from? Samaria was that northern kingdom, the first one to fall. They were the ones who had disobeyed God. That was the kingdom of Israel. Samaria was its capital back in the Old Testament. They fell in 722 B.C., taken over by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians wiped them out. And then they put other peoples in Samaria to live there and to tend the land and care for it. People who weren't even Jewish descendants at all. And, and some of the Jews were still there, mixed with the people who came in, and they commingled. And this Samaritan race was neither Gentile nor Jewish. It was kind of a mongrel people that was rejected by everybody. And that's part of why the Jews hated them. And because the Jews hated them, they became more and more separate until they started building their own temples and their own altars, and offering their own sacrifices to God. We have completely separate from the Jewish people in the southern kingdom of Judah. And there was a hatred that had risen over the centuries. But Jesus said, you will receive power when my spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria. And you got to know the disciples then thought, who would go to Samaria? We don't even talk with them. John's got to be sitting there going, well, I ain't going. We don't talk to those people. That's what Samaritans were. That's what was happening here. And it's interesting that Luke notes, when Philip goes down there and evangelizes them, who gets called? Peter and John, and they both come. Luke is the one who told us what Peter and John thought about Samaritans back in Luke chapter 9. There was a time when Jesus was ministering, and in 9, 51 through 54, it came about when the days were approaching for Jesus' ascension, he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for Jesus to come. And the Samaritans did not receive Jesus because he was journeying towards Jerusalem. They didn't receive people who worshipped in Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John saw this. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That's how John thought about the Samaritan people. They were worthy of being destroyed because they weren't like us. Philip goes and evangelizes them. And when word gets back to Jerusalem that they've become believers, it's not just Peter, but John's like, I got to see this. I got to be part of this. And God chooses him to go. And it's Peter and John who go down to Samaria to see what God has done. And I don't think there's any mistake there that John is part of this pair. And instead of calling down fire from heaven and consume them, they lay hands on them and the fire of God falls, like Acts 2, the fire of the Holy Spirit. And they become just as much a part of the fellowship of believers in the church as the Jews in Jerusalem. This is astounding. This is a shocking development for Jews. Peter's going to struggle with this. John's going to struggle with this. We know because in the next two chapters, they're still struggling with it. 
it's a shocking, significant step for the gospel ministry. Part of what Luke is showing us is there in Acts 1.8. The word of God is going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then, then to the uttermost. And some people might have thought, oh, well, that's because Jews are scattered throughout the world and they all need to hear. Luke is going to show us this gospel goes far beyond the Jews. It goes to the Samaritan people in Samaria. And pretty soon, even more shocking things are going to happen. Luke is setting us up now. This is just Samaria. This is still kind of close. But in chapters 9 and 10, the gospel is going to go to pagan Gentiles. People who had nothing to do with the Jewish history of the Jewish race. To you and I, we are pagan Gentiles by birth. We were excluded from the kingdom. We had nothing to do with it. It's become so normal to us 2,000 years later. But in Luke's day... To write about the gospel going to Samaritans and then Gentiles was shocking. Uh, And if you look in chapter 10, this is a little bit advanced. We're not going to get there for several weeks yet. But if you look in chapter 10 and what happens in that story, when there are just pagan Gentiles, unclean people that Peter is commanded to go and be with them, go and eat with them, have them in his house, be in their house, no good Jew would do that. And look at 10, 45 through 48, what happened there? I'll start with verse 44 of chapter 10. While Peter was still speaking the words, the Holy Spirit fell on those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon Gentiles. And that word for amazed is not just like, oh, wow. That word thalmazo is like, I'm shocked. I'm shook to my core. How has our Holy Spirit gone to them? They didn't expect it. Even though Jesus had said, you'll be my witnesses, that they did not expect. It was shocking to them. This is all the context. They were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then, after the Holy Spirit came, after the Holy Spirit filled them, while Peter was still talking, then he said, we can't refuse water for them to be baptized. We receive the Holy Spirit just as we did, can we? Then they got baptized. That's a whole different scenario than Samaritans who believed and got baptized And then the Holy Spirit came. So when we look, these are three of the most difficult chapters in the New Testament for us to interpret. These are three very strange instances, these chapters. Because they were strange to them, it was a shake-up of the natural order of the day, and that's why I say we need to know how to interpret and what we're going to do with these and be careful with them. Because entire branches of Christianity have taken these and done strange things with them. And made some of this normative for today. It's second blessing and a later receiving the Spirit. And you're not really, you don't have the Spirit just because you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And you can be baptized and be part of the church but not have the, I mean, all that stuff is going to come from these three chapters. So we have to be careful. The spread of the gospel to all people is part of Luke's purpose in this two-volume work of Luke Acts. Uh, This pattern of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost. But the spread of the gospel, that the fact that the gospel is for all people. Luke has planted the seeds of this, and we didn't even know it yet. Luke had this, and people had read it in his first volume, and probably didn't even catch what Luke was doing. But through the amazing inspiration of the Spirit, Luke has developed this whole map, this whole program, and has shown what God is doing. And we don't even catch it. But if you go back to Luke 3... And we look at what Luke has already written, and we're catching Luke's literary theme, and we're catching Luke's purpose. Clear back there in chapter 3, the baptism of Jesus and the declarations that were made. Isaiah 40 gets quoted. It gets quoted in Matthew, and it gets quoted in Mark. It gets quoted here in Luke. After the baptism, or or the preparation of John the Baptist, verse 3 of Luke 2, And he, John the Baptist, came to the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. As it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every ravine shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough road smooth. Now Matthew has that, and Mark has that, but only Luke includes the next verse of Isaiah. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All peoples, all nations will see the salvation. Luke, the Gentile author of the gospel, 
makes sure to point out that this is part of Isaiah's prophecy. It's not just for the Jews. This is not just a Jewish thing. Luke's been setting this up since the beginning of his gospel. The gospel will go to all flesh. In Acts chapter 2, as Luke records the preaching of Peter there on the day of Pentecost, he, he makes sure to include what Peter said so that we know that it's there, the quotation of Joel chapter 2. So if we go to Acts chapter 2, Peter, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, a quotation from Joel chapter 2, here it is. It shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Not just my chosen people Israel. Not just descendants of Jacob. Peter on the day of Pentecost, maybe not even realizing the full weight of what he was saying when he was quoting Joel 2. That God will pour out his spirit on all mankind. And Luke in the book of Acts is going to show us that the spirit is being poured out on all mankind. Starting in Jerusalem, but not just with the Jews. Now it goes to the Samaritans. And in chapter 10, it's going to go to Gentiles. And then Luke is going to leave the ministry in Jerusalem and Judea completely alone. After about chapter 15, Luke is going to focus completely the rest of the book on the ministry to the Gentiles and all around the Mediterranean and all the way into Europe. He's not going to tell us what Peter was doing. He's not going to tell us continue telling us everything Philip was doing. We're not even going to hear, like I said, about Thomas and Bartholomew and Judas and the other Jews. We're not even going to know what those disciples are doing through the book of Acts. Because Luke's program and plan is to show us the gospel expanding to all people. And he takes this opportunity, verse 8, to start making that shift in literature and in theology and in the culture to show us what's happening. And so our study Bible is going to include all of that. We can't just go, well, that's how it happened then. That's how it happens now. We need to understand Luke's program and what he's doing. Throughout Luke's writing, he's giving justification for Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And he's establishing beyond any doubt that the gospel is equally and impartially for all people. And part of how we know that is the verses we already looked at, but especially we look ahead to Acts 22, 19 through 22, nearing the end of the book, and we find this in Paul's ministry when he's in Jerusalem and he's giving a defense for his ministry and what he's done. Luke makes sure we know these words. Starting in Acts 22, about verse 19, Paul speaking, giving defense before the Jewish leaders on the steps of the temple in Jerusalem. I said, Lord, they themselves understand in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. When the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I was standing by. You see how Luke is tying all this together through the story? From Stephen's story and the introduction of Paul, now Paul's testimony decades later, tying back to the story of Stephen. When the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I stood by approving and watching for the cloaks of those who were slaying him. And God said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And the Jewish leaders listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and said, away with this fellow from the earth. He should not be allowed to live. Why? Because the Gentiles weren't supposed to have anything to do with the Jewish religion. Luke is showing that Christianity is not a Jewish religion, that God has now poured out his spirit on all flesh, all mankind, not even just the Samaritans, but the Gentiles also. This is a massive theme in Luke's works, both his gospel and his story. And we've got to have good Bible study habits to see that and to catch what's going on. So that, yes, he's giving us an accurate historical description in Acts 8 of what happened, but he's got a plan for that. And there's a reason that he's showing us these stories because the disciples themselves needed to know and to verify that God's Spirit had come even to the Samaritans. And, and leaders of the church like Peter and John and James will need to know in their hearts that God has given His Spirit to the Gentiles also. And it's this massive transition that's taking place in the kingdom of God. All this is going back into Acts 8. All this is part of what Luke has been showing us and what Luke is doing so when we come to Acts 8, we go, this is an accurate historical description 
But Luke is not intending to prescribe that this should happen this way all the time because it happens differently in chapter 10. It's a different order. And we can't say, well, this is how it... No, no, no. Pentecostals are just wrong. They just are. The entirety of the Roman Catholic Church is just wrong on this passage. And their whole teaching on the baptism of infants and then a later confirmation and priest will say, this child has now received the pledge of the Holy Spirit. It's just wrong. It's not scriptural. It's not built on sound theology. So if you've heard stuff and you've been exposed to stuff, you've kind of wondered about, well, do I really have the Holy Spirit? Did it come? I never had this experience. I never spoke in tongues. I never did miracles. I never saw great things happen. I don't think I've ever prophesied. Said, These are historical events that happened in a certain way as God's kingdom was just exploding in a whole new way. They're not to be taken as normative or prescribed. How do I know? Because we got the rest of the New Testament. And that's part of hermeneutics. We're going to go to very clear passages to interpret these difficult passages. And that's what we do next. We find out that all born-again children of God have received the Holy Spirit. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, you understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The things that Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. I delivered to you what I first received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day. He doesn't go on to, and if you receive the Spirit, and if you do signs, and no, 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 the essence of the gospel is so clear there and elsewhere. Luke is not teaching on the Holy Spirit in Acts 8. Luke is being a great historian. He's got a theological theme to the whole book that he's teaching. He's not giving an exposition on the Holy Spirit. He gives an account of what happened. He doesn't try to explain it in, Luke, in Acts 8, does he? Well, you see, this is because he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't try to give a justification. He's not giving a theological reasoning for it. He just records what happened. He's got a literary structure and a theological point to this, but he's not expanding on all this in, Luke, in Acts 8. The New Testament is quite clear on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in many, many other passages. Romans 8, we had it read earlier for our scripture reading. Uh, you may or may not have paid attention to it. It said very clearly, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to God. You're not of His. In other words, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to Him. But verse 9, you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then your body's dead because of sin, and the Spirit is alive now because of righteousness. And your spirit is now revived and alive because of righteousness. Titus 2, 11 through 13, I don't even have here, but it says, not by works which you have done, but by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. I think that's Titus 2, 5. That's how we become believers in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has to regenerate us. He has to give life to our spirit so that we can receive him. Galatians 3, 1 through 7 and 23 to 29 and 4, 4 through 7, make it so clear that all of those who are adopted, all of those who become believers, have the gift of the Spirit within them. Ephesians, we spent a year studying that. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, that great passage at the beginning. You've been predestined, you've been called, you've been chosen, and you have been given the Spirit as a down payment. It's worth looking at. I know we're out of time. But we need to see that these passages are so clear. And Ephesians 1, I can't flip to this one-handed very well. He predestined us to adoption through Jesus Christ to the praise of his glory of his grace. Verse 11, we've obtained the inheritance having been predestined to it. Verse 13, in him, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Everyone who believes is sealed with the Holy Spirit. He regenerates you. He indwells you. He baptizes you in the family of God. He seals you. All of these things happen at the moment of salvation. These other passages bear reading during the week. All children of God have received the Holy Spirit. If you've wondered, if you've doubted, thought, well, bad things happen and things don't work out, that's not necessarily a sign of God's disapproval or that you missed the Holy Spirit. There's clear teaching on the Holy Spirit sealing every single believer. What are we going to do with that? 
It means that if you're a Christian, you have the power of God living in you. Romans 8 would say, the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in you. He lives within you. He dwells within you. That's power. That's amazing power. If you're a Christian now, you have an obligation to live by the Spirit. That's what Romans 8 says. Not to live for yourself anymore. But it's not just like beat yourself up, you have an obligation, be harsh with yourself. You have the ability. You have full access now to live supernatural, hypernatural lives by the Spirit that lives within you. And you have the ability by faith and obedience in total dependence. You can live by the power of God. Jesus said, I don't, I don't work on my own. I don't speak on my own. I do all things that the Father shows me. Jesus lived in total dependence on the Father. Guess what? We're able to do that now too. We get to. Now I realize this teaching on the Spirit. It was new to them. It's new to some of us. Like, man, I don't, I don't know that I've ever really understood this. I don't know that I've ever really worked this out. No, I don't know if I live in total dependence on the Father. You may spend your entire lifetime experiencing what this means. And as I said, not just learning what it means, experiencing what it means in growing degree and understanding. Not that you get more of the Holy Spirit, and not that more of Him comes down to you somehow. The power that raised Christ from the dead is already within you. And you get to live by it. Uh, you are welcomed to live by it. You're, you're offered, you're expected to live by the Holy Spirit. Your life may not have indicated that. But remember these six words, up until now and from now on. And maybe you'd say, up until now, I don't know if I've lived by the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I've understood that. I don't know if I've realized and grasped, I have the Holy Spirit within me. Well, from now on, you get to learn to live by that and learn what that looks like and understand how to live that out day by day. And that's part of what we're going to be doing through the book of Acts. Some of this is laying again the foundations for the church and needing to understand this basis for who and what we are as the people of God. Great way to symbolize and celebrate that. So this morning we're going to take communion. So song leaders, come on up and those who are going to help serve communion. This says we all come to Christ the same way. Jew, Samaritan, full-on Gentiles, pagans like us at birth. Because of the cross of Christ, we have full access to this covenant that Jesus made. Celebrate that this morning.